Hello, good afternoon. I'm hoping you can all hear me in these times of lockdown. I've got a phone on one side and a laptop on another and I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> um, a very warm welcome um, to this afternoon's talk, which is the sensory experience of Islamic arts with Dr. Susan Bagai. Bye bye. Oh, thank you. I can already see your, your comments coming up. Um, Dr. Susan Babai is reader in the arts of Iran and Islamic arts, and I'm highlighting the Islamic arts because I know that Bradford and Yorkshire particularly were really looking forward to this. Um, my name is Sonia Kilty, and I'm at present the volunteer coordinator at Bradford Libraries, Museums and Galleries. But when we installed this exhibition, um, which I think was November now last year, um, I was then the curator of exhibitions, which included as one of our national touring shows, this one. So this is really important that we carry on those partnerships. Um, this afternoon's talk is a collaboration between Bradford Museums and Galleries and the Courtauld's to accompany the exhibition, which is the precious and rare Islamic metalwork from the Courtauld. And I'm hoping that most of you did actually get a chance to see that before we, we had to close it too early. Um, and Precious and Rare is a touring exhibition of four UK venues. So some of you may have already seen them in Cornwall and other various uh, UK venues that held, held this. And it's in collaboration with the Subject Specialist Network in Islamic Art and Material Culture, the SSN. That's a good group to join. I mean, again, I'm hoping that during these panels we could add maybe some of these websites and these links if people want to join and gain membership to various parties. It was also funded by the Art Fund, which again, Google them, they, I know particularly for Bradford, for their purchasing grants for a lot of the projects we do, they're a major partner. Um, Suzanne was originally due to talk at Cartwright Hall Art Gallery in Bradford in February, so we had a load of you booked for that. That event was postponed because of Storm Chiara, then we rescheduled it to a date in March, and now we've had to cancel that for a pandemic. So I'm hoping I'm not going to see a locust or anything come past me at this point. And we are now online, which actually is better because I know that now we've got people from all over the world joining us and figures tenfold what we would have normally been able to fit into our gallery in Yorkshire. So it's actually a bonus in some kind of a ways. So I'm especially delighted that we're now able to host Susan's talk online and so many of you are joining us. Susan's talk will be about 40 minutes and there'll be a 15 minutes um, at the end for questions. If you'd like to submit a question this afternoon, please do using the chat box, which a lot of you now know how to use Zoom. And Amy Graves, the Registrar Exhibitions and Projects at the portal, will also be asking Susan some of our some of our and your questions um, throughout. So it's a little bit different to those lunchtime talks that people know at Cartwright Hall Gallery, but it's, it's the new modern world, which is a good one. Finally, do look out for further announcements in the coming weeks about the rescheduled dates for Precious and Rare touring exhibition, which will continue to tour around later this year. Um, and just before I do hand you over to Suzanne, just be half on Bradford, I do want to say, um, that we thank our friends of museums and galleries who support projects like this. It's Volunteers Week this week, so we've all got our volunteers hat on. And without our friends, and if you join the membership of the friends, £10 a year, 20% off in the shops and the cafes, you support us with projects like this. Um, and we're obviously closed at the moment, Cartwright Hall Art Gallery, the Civic Art Gallery for Bradford, and our three other museums are all closed. We're waiting and we're working on reopening. So we hope to welcome our visitors soon like other European and worldwide museums at the time. Um, and we are, like I say, happy to take questions from the audience via the chat. So keep giving your feedback and keep interacting. Um, and I'd now like to welcome Dr. Suzanne Babai and thank you and enjoy the afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can see me and hear me now in my bedroom. And uh, we all move around in these clunky ways, trying to connect to the world beyond. 
by these webinars and teaching opportunities and just having Zoom parties and so forth. I'm sure everyone knows what this feels like and, and uh, how it works. I just want to say first, thank you very much, Sonia, for your introduction. I'm delighted to be uh, virtually present and I'm going to try to bring you to experience something very briefly of what this exhibition uh, would have looked like or felt like, even give you some hints to the next venues if you go and see them, or else we all want to welcome you to the Courtauld Gallery when we open and all these objects return home, so to speak. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do actually is to speak about Islamic arts for a, uh, for a little bit, but through the lens of sensory experiences of the works of art and not through any uh, uh, geographical or chronological framework, nor in terms of particular media, or even uh, I will forego the idea of what is Islamic art. Uh, we'll get to some of those along the way. But what I'd like to do is, in fact, focus our attention more on what would make it possible for us to see works of art uh, from the Islamic world through the lens of how they are experienced, actually. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that you see me in the corner of your screen so we have a, some semblance of, and I need to make this my um, my big screen. So allow me one second longer to see how I can get rid of all these additional bits and pieces and um, go back to sharing screen in its fullness. Um, if I can manage that, and it looks like I can't. Uh, so Allow me to just continue because otherwise time will be wasted along the way of technological handling of this. Uh, so my, my uh, goal is to produce or, or introduce you one to this exhibition, Precious and Rare Islamic Metalwork from the Courtauld, which is uh, in lockdown in Bradford, uh, to uh, also point to you the mm -hmm. fact that many of the objects that we see here are in, the, in a gallery where some of the works within the museum are also on display. In other words, they are fitted into a context, one of the objects of which I will get to in a moment, uh, to really um, sort of uh, invoke the, the experiential aspect of looking at such objects. Uh, such as the ones that you see in the lower part of the slide, the Courtauld bag, which would be the, uh, the highlight of the talk at the end, uh, that big, huge brass bowl, but also small objects. The one here, there is a little uh, globe-like uh, hand warmer incense burner, uh, which I also want to focus on. Before we go there, uh, to the sort of larger ideas. Let me introduce you to the subject or the thematic approach I'm taking to the subject of Islamic arts through sensory experiences. Uh, this incense burner, which is probably one of the smallest, if not the smallest known of these incense burners, fits into the palm of the hand, actually. I have small hands, so it, it in fact does fit into my hand with a glove, of course. Uh, it, uh, it is uh, made of uh, at least two pieces. Usually these incense burners have a, an internal structure as well, which I will uh, show you in a moment uh, too. Uh, this one has two interlocking hemispherical pieces made of brass. It's hammered, pierced, and then inlaid and engraved with silver so that they basically uh, brightly uh, um, project out of the surface. On these surfaces, uh, you find the depictions on these hemispherical shapes, the depictions of the sun 
on the top, as you can see here, and then below it, this ring of the personifications of the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, the solar system, in other words, with the understanding implicit there that the Earth is inside, that it is here, that it is on Earth, that we are actually experiencing this object. Such incense burners as this uh, extraordinary piece, but also a large number of different shapes, some in the shape of animals, some in the shape of uh, hemispheres with, uh, with a ring at the end attached, such as the one you see on the right-hand side, which is larger. They were made extensively throughout the Islamic world, and especially greatest examples survive from the medieval period. These are both from this late 13th, early 14th century, both attributed to Syria, potentially Damascus, and both date to the time when the Mamluk dynasty was in rule in uh, Egypt and Syria. The one on the right is a hanging object. You can tell from, uh, from this uh, contraption on top, and it is larger. This one is 15.9 centimeters in diameter, uh, whereas uh, our little uh, incense burner or hand warmer, as some have suggested, is only about five centimeters in diameter. They were meant to be filled in this, uh, in this uh, structure in the middle with uh, a hot coal and the aromatics, usually aloe and sandalwood. We know from historical documents that a great deal of this, uh, the aromatics were indeed uh, uh, exported, imported, traded across the Islamic world. I just wanted to share with you a, 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 a very brief uh, indication of how important it was and how often they were used in a number of contexts. It could be in a religious context, as in mosques, uh, burning of, of aromatics, incense, uh, but it could also be in private homes and private contexts. We know that in the, um, uh, there's an account by Al Mas'udi, a historian, uh, about the Caliph Al Ma'mun in the ninth century, early in the ninth century, where we hear that the Caliph presided over weekly gathering of the jurists in, on Tuesdays, and that on those days the jurists were first fed. Uh, they had a meal, then they were, uh, incense burners were brought into the room where they were so that they would become fragrant, if you will, before they enter the, uh, the presence of the caliph, in fact. So what we know from the historical sources is that the amount of these kinds of aromatic substances that were uh, procured and used and even gifted across the entirety of Islamic world by different local rulers between the caliph and a local ruler and so forth is staggering. In other words, historical documents confirm the significance of the use of such aromatics and then the making of objects for their use. And, and these incense burners and the one that you, we have at the Courtauld in particular are an indication of the very preciousness as well of that aromatic, the fragrance that it would emanate, and the fact that you could touch the object and that element of touch, smell, the weight of the object, the warmth of it, because it would have been with a coal inside, all of those bring the object to life in a way that its exhibition, perhaps in a gallery, would not allow us to experience it as we should understand at least was the context of its, of its use. This one, the one from the Courtauld, is also completely uh, in the shape of a globe and can be rolled. And given the fact that the uh, contraption inside is engineered so that it always keeps the coal, hot coal balanced on top. You can imagine such an object being rolled on the carpet from one person to another in a meeting uh, of uh, grandees, perhaps, 
at a court or at uh, the court of the caliph. This sort of an evocation of the sensorial experiences beyond the subject uh, of our, uh, of our uh, viewing in the museum, which is silent, seemingly silent, is absolutely brilliantly captured by a work uh, by Soraya Syed, an artist whose particular emphasis on calligraphy is um, uh, her inspiration. Uh, this was a commissioned work for the Cartwright Hall Art Gallery in Bedford. And uh, I urge you to get online later on and look at the video made of the way in which this object actually functions and the ways in which she introduces new technologies into this ancient, uh, revered art of writing and calligraphy. So it's a holographic installation as a short animation. I can only capture or convey something of, of it by these still images, uh, whereby she has used an old pen case ink box not unlike the one that you see on the lower side of the screen, which is an Ottoman pen case with its inkwell of 18th century. Uh, she uses one of those with the reed pens inside of it and creates this very mysterious, absolutely mesmerizing emanation in holographic mode of letters coming out, but also provokes something of that sense of smell that one imagines from such an object. This kind of emphasis on the writing, on the, on the feel of the object, on the way we come to experience these elements of writing in a work like Soraya Syed's uh, Pen and the Sword, where she compares the pen, the power of the pen uh, and the sword and privileging the pen, in fact, relate to some of the uh, concepts that are fundamental to an understanding of Islamic arts, such as the significance of, of epigraphy and calligraphy, the art of beautiful writing, which covers everything from, uh, from the coins to the buildings, from uh, incense burners and, and basins to copies, of course, of manuscripts of classical texts, but above all, the copying of the Holy Quran, in which case then we have the word of God transmitted through these graphic signs of writing and distributed across the globe of the Islamic world. So in the Quran, uh, in Surah 68, it begins with the phrase Nun wal qalam wa mayasturun. And this Nun by the pen and what they inscribe, basically. It's an enigmatic sentence, as Yves Porter, one of my colleagues, has, has actually indicated, where the assumption or the picture that we get from such a, such a, uh, uh, such a, uh, a construction in the Quran is that of the angels dipping their pen in the inkwell of the noon, the letter noon, which is the, the round letter looking like, in fact, an ink ball. And then it's interpreted in the later traditions that this is a way of attributing to the art of writing and the instrument with which the writing is done, the reed pen, the uh, kind of divine uh, value, the homage that goes also to the calligraphers. In other words, the act of writing itself becomes ennobling, it becomes an act of worship almost. And we know that this, this aspect, aspect of writing is one of the key elements of Islamic art, where as uh, Abul Fath, the historian and Grand Vizier of the Mughal Emperor Akbar says, the letter, a magical power, is spiritual geometry emanating from the pen of invention, a heavenly writ from the hand of fate. It contains the secret of the word, 
and is the tongue of the hand. What is so crucial in all of this is the picture that, that uh, the author is uh, uh, projecting of the way the writing of the letters in Arabic of the Quran itself really produce knowledge, produce spiritual uplift and ideas that are beyond what is the physical realm. So many of these objects, and in particular, uh, the uh, kinds of objects that we look at, but we do not really extend our experience of them to that of uh, all the senses in a way, are in fact carrying those messages for us. I'm just giving you an example here of the way in which the moving of the reed pen on a piece of paper, those who do calligraphy know this, when you put your, the, the uh, tip of the pen into ink and then glide it onto a, uh, a paper, a piece of paper that is prepared for the purposes of writing, it actually makes a sound. There is a sound of it gliding over the paper. There's a sense of touch embedded in the way in which the pen is handled. The smell of the ink, anyone who does this sort of thing knows that there is the, all these elements come into play. And then what you write is what you read, what you hear, such as, for instance, the calli calligraphic exercise on the right hand side, which is in the, in the Cartwright Hall Art Gallery in, in Bradford and is by an artist uh, from Lucknow in, in India. And it, in it, Fi and Heech are repeatedly uh, calligraphed in this very dramatic, uh, extended, attenuated letter forms, which get thicker ink and thinner ink, creating those sort of visual, uh, uh, visual excitement, which can be really translated to the way you sound the letters as well. Or in this poem of Hafez uh, from Shiraz, uh, which is copied in Nasta'lir uh, calligraphy. This is a, a script, a style of script that is developed specifically to convey the sound of Persian language poetry, in fact. And in this case, uh, the great calligrapher of 16th century, Mir Ali al Haravi uh, from Herat, uh, is the author where he would exercise his hand in a way that conveys the sounds of uh, the poem itself. Um, elsewhere, we see these kinds of very uh, basic principle elements of Islamic art incorporated into a number of different contexts and with different media. Uh, this uh, large brass bowl, which is also hammered, engraved, and then inlaid with silver to create these chromatic effects. It basically picks out the letters of the inscription around the body of the object Further, and it's in another script, this is the Thuluth script, uh, which is particularly popular in the uh, Mamluk period on these objects, very monumental in their scale, uh, fitting the object in many ways as well. This conveys, it is in the exhibition, it is sitting on, uh, on the, uh, in, a, uh, in a display uh, area, and you cannot touch it. But it is the touching, the feeling of the weight, for instance, of the object, and knowing that the inscription around it has a sound dimension that you could, if you could read, and most of us need ex experts to read these uh, inscribed uh, uh, passages, that there is a sound dimension, as well as the seeing, as well as the feeling of the object. And most likely what it was used for, which is itself another dimension of the experience of such objects. Objects of utility, or what used to be called in the, in the 50s, for instance, as industrial arts, or then 
objects of utility or perhaps elevated to luxury objects of utility until we finally elevated them with the understanding that this is a, a, a high ranking kind of artistic production uh, in the Islamic world. Unlike European arts where painting and sculpture maybe uh, have precedence over decorative arts or portable arts, uh, these are uh, filled with invested with meaning, with social meaning, as well as with, with aesthetic uh, uh, elevation and really sit within the context of or categories of Islamic arts as at the very high level. Part of the way we understand these is really that experience with the personal experience with the object. An object such as this is even signed. Many of them are signed. We think signing of artworks is only relevant to art of painting or sculpture. In the Islamic world, many of these objects of metalwork are signed, in fact, in this case, a, an engraver from Mosul in northern Iraq of today uh, by the name of Ali ibn al-Abdullah al-Alawi. He was an Alawi and he considers himself a Naqash al-Mosuli. He is a designer, painter, depending on how we were to, to interpret these terminology from Mosul. It's this kind of a uh, a ewer and a basin where what we know that in, in great ceremonies of feasting, of receptions, uh, such as the one that I noted earlier on with the caliph's uh, court, such objects would be used and you would actually be in fact in very close contact with the object. And that dimension of intimacy meant that an enormous uh, uh, investment has gone into the details, into really making the surfaces come alive with inlay, with, uh, with uh, uh, engravings, or in the case of even a mihrab, and I show you a detail of a mihrab uh, which was commissioned by the Ilhani ruler, one of the descendants of Genghis Khan, who come to rule uh, Iran and Iraq of today, as well as extend their, uh, their sphere of influence into the Caucasus and Central Asia, where this commission of a mihrab entirely made of stucco, carved stucco, one piece, as if it is layer upon layer, it invokes something of the feeling that one gets from, for instance, the, the uh, basin that we just looked at, but in a different medium with a different scale and a different function. But they all share in certain aspects, which are, of course, aspects ordinarily understood to be fundamental to an understanding of Islamic arts, like the significance of calligraphy, like the sig significance of geometry, the abstraction and stylization of natural forms and so forth, but that they share as well that element of evocations of sensory experiences, which we tend to not pay attention to when we look at pictures or we look at objects from a distance actually, but that we should invoke those experiences. This extends to textiles, to illuminated pages, to ceramic objects, to um, architectural uh, surfaces and objects of utility and uh, of luxury that we see um, throughout the Islamic world. I also want us to be alert to the fact that books, we look at painting, for instance, in the Islamic world by looking at a page with a painting such as the Maqamat of Al-Hariri on the left-hand side, or a, a double page opened of a manuscript of the Shahnameh, Book of Kings, which is uh, itself a, a massive epic poem, uh, just as Maqamat is a collection of stories uh, about experience of life in medieval Baghdad and Iraq, uh, Abbasid Iraq, basically. What they 
uh, ask us to do in addition to knowing how paper is made, how painting is made, why these stories, why these particular uh, representations and so forth and styles and so forth. It also asks us and I want to encourage uh, you to actually think about painting which sometimes comes out of a book detached from the book itself and framed and put on a wall in a museum as belonging to a whole object. The thing itself, the book itself is the work of art and that that requires a certain degree of in fact, a great de de degree of personal interaction. You hold the book, you feel the weight of the book, the smell of paper, the, the feel of the cover, the leather cover and so forth. The way as you turn the page and read a text, uh, you come to a page with paintings such as the one on the right hand side, how it changes the way the mind works how it, the rhythm of, of reading and reciting comes to a stop while the visual begins to take over, how the light changes, and what does this totality mean in terms of how we are supposed to actually look at Islamic arts, that each of these stand alone as an object all to themselves, that it is that that object, totality of it, and its life really, and what it generates, what it invokes, that becomes so important to keep reminding ourselves of. The other aspect, taking off from the Maqamot and the Shahname, is that so many of these objects carry figural representations, which are essentially uh, related to uh, a textual world or else they are evocative and personifications of certain types, certain ideas, perhaps. I want to just highlight this by way of example, two examples from medieval Iranian world of uh, um, uh, ceramics of enormous uh, importance in terms of a technology, a really revolutionary technology where you could make uh, the clay body so thin, so elegant, and then paint on it with these glazes, despite the fact that they are fired at high temperatures and preserve those paintings on them, that in these cases, stories that are known by the literate crowds, literate communities, who know the stories of the Shahnameh of Bahram Gur or of Bijan and Manije can actually be reminded even of a passage, recite passages relevant to these images uh, where the image comes without a text. So these kinds of crossings, uh, intercrossings of media, of ideas, of knowledge, and the fact that we turn, for instance, that beaker, which is in, the, in Washington's uh, uh, Asian Art Museum, the National Museum of Asian Arts, and you can turn something like that in order to both read the text, but also as you drink out of a beaker like that, to see the images and be reminded of these stories that people knew, literate people knew. That kind of uh, hearing the story even without the text. We have manuscripts such as we see in the right hand side of this story Bahram Gur and Azadeh. But this is the Sasanian king and his beloved who challenged him in a hunting uh, uh, trip. We know the stories. Uh, in other words, we know it now because we read these texts. But we have to, to understand that in their own time, many of these were known by heart, just as much as you could be uh, in, uh, in technical terms, not literate, but uh, literate in terms of uh, memorized material. You could be uh, reciting verses of the Holy Quran without actually reading it. You could see it on a building and recognize it without having to read the whole thing and knowing where it belongs. 
This is a really important part of the experience of Islamic art across a vast region. And because I'm so focused on this notion of, of sensory experiences in this context, I wanted to get us to think, let me make sure that I'm not going over my time. I wanted us to think a little bit also about the other less visible or less elevated sensory experiences, such as that of taste. So we looked at smell and its relationship to the shape of the uh, incense burner, the feel of the incense burner, the warmth of it even, the weight of it, for instance. We thought about the way in which uh, Suraya Syed's work, in fact, brings to life the ink well and the uh, pen case and, and provokes those thoughts beyond the silent object related to writing, related to the pen, related to the conceptual uh, sort of links amongst various uh, um, ideas that uh, really surround these objects. I also wanted to at least uh, touch on, the, on this uh, sense of taste, uh, which has to do with uh, perhaps uh, one of those senses that is oftentimes devalued or lowered in relation to, for instance, the state of sense of sight, to uh, point to the fact that many objects in the Islamic world that carry calligraphic or epigraphic uh, information, like uh, lines of poetry, also uh, are used very knowingly on objects. And uh, many of the ones that we have looked at, for instance, that big basin, which is in the Courtauld collection, invokes the, the uh, power and, and authority of the ruler through its selection of calligraphic uh, bands or, or epigraphic bands. In these cases that I'm showing you just a sampling of these, the objects are eloquent, are made eloquent, and they hear they speak about what their use is or how they are used, just as much as a, sen a, 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 a incense burner may have a place within the court context or even in uh, elite household and in religious context, such objects have a role to play in, say, gatherings around communal eating, feasting, and so forth, where the object speaks about its own function, that it says if you, if you eat from somebody's uh, suffrage, from somebody's table, then don't go around. If you eat bread with them, don't go around and break the salt shaker. Uh, aphorisms and sayings that point to the ways in which uh, the communal use of such objects in, in feast, in commensal eating, would also bring to life uh, the object by way of both the images and the particular choice of calligraphic lines or text. So that sense of touch, sight, are also integrated with the sense of taste. There's something of that tastefulness that comes through. One of the most amusing of such objects is, is this um, bowl, which is not terribly large, nor is it considered among the most beautiful objects uh, of Islamic uh, ceramics, but it has an inscription that has been read variously, but it basically says, if the soup is good, who cares if the bowl is not beautiful? And it's in relevance to the fact that the content or the, the sort of the spiritual content, if you will, the conversation is more important than the appearances. So it has, it's, it's a, uh, it's a lighthearted ingest kind of a statement, but in many of these instances, we encounter uh, the, uh, the reference to something higher, something uh, profound, in fact. And 
um, I want to conclude this talk by bringing you uh, to look closer at the Courtauld bag, which is in the exhibition, and it is one of the uh, perhaps the masterpiece of Islamic metalwork that the Courtauld Gallery uh, has within its collection. It has a beautiful collection of Islamic arts. Uh, this one, however, holds the pride of place. It's a, um, it was the centerpiece of an exhibition in 2014 at the Courtauld Gallery. Uh, and indeed, it remains one of the key objects, at least for me, to talk about in terms of the, uh, the experience of the visual material in Islamic culture, especially in this medieval period. So this was made in Mosul, the same place as at Alawi Mosuli did that wonderful basin and, and the ewer. There is, uh, we know that this was in, made in Mosul, not because it is signed, it doesn't have a sign or a date, signature or a date, but because of its comparative material, whereby we understand that this must have been made in Mosul as well. In the period when this was made, that is just at the turn of the 14th century, Mosul held the prime position in terms of its metalwork industry. It was the center of production of the highest quality inlaid metalware. And this was commissioned most likely by the overlords of the time, the Ilhanid uh, dynasty, from their center in the city of Tabriz, which is in northwestern Iran. So today we talk about countries, but what in this period and really in pre-modern eras we should think about is not about countries as we know them, about nation states, so much as about these vast zones of cultural connectedness. And to think in terms of how an object like this was made for a, a, an elite household in uh, Tabriz of an ethnicity which is very different from either Arabs or Iranians uh, who had come in from outside. These are the Mongol rulers after the conquest of this region in the Islamic world. They set up uh, their dynasty here. Uh, but that they adopt the highest levels of artistic expression, uh, literary expression, uh, and, uh, and basically patronize them, fitting themselves into this really rich, intercultural, very diverse uh, scene of uh, production. So here we have a bag that was made in Mosul, most likely with iron sheets or sheets of metal that were brought from Syria to Mosul with images on it that are partly related to image making that is uh, uh, sort of popular in the region, uh, but also seen in other objects from Mosul and even Eastern Iran with, uh, with these incredibly sophisticated uh, patterns of, uh, for instance, the roundels and the geometries that are interlocking, these background grooves that we find having been engraved and then inlaid, picking up the main images of a horseman on, and his horse with silver and gold, and the surrounding images, all of which really bring us to come very close to the object you cannot see these unless you actually hold the object in hand. But I'm encouraging you to try to look at them as closely as you can to really see the way the surface comes to life. These are all details. And I had the good fortune to have some of these uh, details in high resolution to show you how varied they are. These roundels with musicians and cupbearers. Uh, each of them busy doing something, uh, an activity that relates to a courtly environment of merrymaking, of richness and liveliness. And all of them evoke 
other images familiar from other objects, including paintings and ceramics and metalwork of another kind. So creating a, a family of images uh, which were familiar to the viewers and users of these in, uh, extraordinary objects. This bag in particular is a very special uh, work in that it displays the craftsmanship, the highest level of craftsmanship, but also the sophistication of an object which has a shape we don't quite have an example of. And I want to show you some of the ways that we have understood how this object functioned where it belonged because it's a unique object as well. We know that it was a bag or, or a container, if you will, because of the way in which it opens on top, it has these loops on the side, and that it was indeed holder of something. Uh, originally, it was thought to be a wallet meant to be used for the transfer of documents. In other words, connected to a man's world. More recent research has revealed uh, mostly the, the work of the guest curator, Rachel Ward, and the companions in scholarship that she brought together, that this was a bag for a woman, actually. It was the it bag of its time, probably, uh, and that it was made with the most sophisticated technology in hammering, shaping, inlay, uh, and so forth. Uh, out of uh, out of really one sheet of metal, it's really extraordinary piece from a technical point of view, and has the images on its sides, these roundels that I showed you earlier in large size, or these larger pieces on the two uh, front and back of the object of the horseman uh, collectively around the object evoking a scene of revelry, a courtly environment. On top of it is this fantastically original, really creative uh, rectangular shape cover, which displays a scene of revelry. Very hard to read it with the loss of inlay, but in fact, what it is, this image on the top is that of the top of the, build, um, of the object, and then the bottom of it. I just want you to see the ways the eye changes its focus and, and do, does something else, reads almost, when it looks on the top or these roundels with the images of merrymakers or moves on to a very abstract exploration of the grooved surfaces and the decorative geometric patterns. The top of the uh, lid, this is a scene uh, a kind of a drinking party, if you will, with the protagonist in a large size depicted at the center here. Much of the inlay is lost, so very hard to see her, accompanied by someone who is in half kneeling pose here, offering her uh, something like a, uh, like a glass or a bowl. And then people on either side carrying objects on one side, for instance, drinking vessels and bottles and so forth. Uh, and on the other side, on the right-hand side, someone who carries a, 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 a fan and, and musical instruments, and one who is standing directly behind her, who is a standing uh, attendant, carrying a bag over his shoulder, you can see it here, which is, exactly what we should be zooming in on, which is to say this is the image that tells us what this bag was about and where it was used. We don't know of a composition like that top composition from other material that are in metal actually of this period, but we know that this kind of compositional arrangement of figural representations were exercised in the production of manuscripts in Tabriz, the center of the Ilkhanids, uh, such as these small Shahnameh copies that you see on the left-hand side. So it's very possible 
that the design for the top was sent from one of these scriptorium atelier kitab khane uh, sites in Tabriz uh, from the center of the court to Mosul with a request that this bag be made according to Mosuli style and technology, but with this additional top piece. That this was a bag belonging to a khatun, one of the top sort of ranks of women in the Ilhanid household is uh, alive to us through representations of such scenes of feasting and courtly gatherings. Among those, we have, for instance, this late 14th century painting in the British Library, where a, a prince and a princess seated in a garden setting of a feast are accompanied by a number of people. Amongst them are two attendants, one of them a woman who holds a bag very much similar in shape to the Courtauld bag, and it's colored gold, in other words, evoking a metal object, actually. Or uh, such a drawing as this one, <clears throat> which shows the attendant with, uh, with the khatun, the, the elite woman of the court, uh, carrying a bag over his shoulder, the same way as the image on top of the picture uh, I showed you earlier of the top would indicate this. So we see it, we can feel the size of it, we can imagine the way it was looked at, how it was carried, in the context of a feast or a high-ranking gathering for the woman who was of a high rank within the court, a khatun. We can also point here to the writing which surrounds this lid and hear what that says. I have the translation at the bottom and I want you to hear how it is recited by, uh, by a great, uh, a great uh, teacher of Arabic who comes from Mosul, actually, and now lives in, uh, in Munich. Al-Izz, wal-Iqbal, wal-Ni'ama, wal-Afdal, wa-Bulugh, al-Amal, wa-Salah, al-A'mal, wal-Ikram, wal-Ijlal, wal-Ihsan, wal-Ijmal, wal-Dawla, بلا زوال والسعادة بلا انفصال والتمام والكمال والسلام I'll take his والسلام that's all to be my, my uh, guide to end the talk with uh, showing you something which is a, a really wonderful piece. I was going to bring it to Bradford when I was scheduled to come there. Forgive me for the clunkiness of the activity, but I wanted to show you, this is a replica of the bag, which was made by Guillaume Olive, who is a, um, the director of our program uh, and design, the manager of program and design for the Courtauld Connects. And he has made a full replica, so beautiful, that you must see it. It opens up just like the bag does. It is of course empty and it has the loops on the sides where I could have worn it, I won't do so, but I could have worn it like those attendants did in those wonderful images that we have as well as what we have from the very top of the bag uh, telling us where it was used, how it was used, what is the context really and how important it is for us to experiences, experience these objects through that dimension of sensorial richness. Thank you very much for being here, for listening to me. And indeed, I'm delighted to hear any questions anyone might have that has been uh, given to Amy. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that absolutely wonderful talk. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amy Graves. So um, as mentioned earlier, I'm the Registrar for Exhibitions and Projects at the Courtauld Gallery. Um, and I have some questions for you, Suzanne. So the first question is, let me just see. 
To what extent can we recreate the sensory experience of a specific object in its original context based on our own modern experience and impression of that object? What will be our limitations and what risks are there? Hmm, very good question. Thank you. There are limitations and there are very many risks, pitfalls galore actually on the way. Uh, the, the point about this is it requires us to look at the object uh, through the lens of its being a living thing, if you will, and invoking the kinds of uh, information that we need to essentially tease out of the object. So one of the ways that we teach at the Courtauld, and I very much exercise with regards to works of art, uh, whatever the subject, is that you start with the object and then begin to build around its context in terms of uh, the textual sources that you would pull together, uh, the, even the, um, the architectural spatial environments uh, and the way they are made, the making of these objects are indicative of how important it was indeed to look at the surface in terms of its grooves, what, what projects out, what is picked out by color of uh, silver or, or gold and so forth. So it's a, it's a multi-dimensional study of the object. It requires linguistic access, it requires knowing the technology, it requires knowing the historical context, it requires knowing other objects of its kind, and then you pull together from all these bits and pieces the most likely scenario you can possibly put together to evoke that sensorial experience. What I'm saying is that this is, a, um, is an area of study worthy of exploration. Um, in addition to others, of course, and other methods of approach. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, someone has asked actually if there's a catalogue. I think I can actually answer that, that there is no catalogue for the exhibition in Bradford, um, but there is an, a catalogue for, uh, for the exhibition that you mentioned, the Court and Craft exhibition that, that was at the Courtauld Gallery in 2014. So if anyone is interested, um, you can get that catalogue online, I think. Um, just to say, I know that we are running a, a little late, but if people don't mind staying on, we've got a few more questions. So the next question is, how is an object such as the bowl at the Metropolitan Museum, that the soup bowl that you mentioned, what can it tell us about the artist or artisan who made it? Beyond the artist's signature, is there a proper way to discuss the individual or unknown artists mm. of Islamic objects? Mm. That's a really good question too, and it's a, it's a, um, it's very much at, uh, at the forefront of everyone's thinking how and, and if even necessary for us to really chase the individual artists. Um, the object in the Met doesn't have a signature that I can say so-and-so was the great ceramicist who did this, but we do have a lot of objects, ceramic objects, metal objects, and so forth, with signatures on them. What we don't have is a sense of a, a biography. We don't know exactly who they are, what kinds of environments they lived in, unless we happen to come across some treatises or some gathering of information around the great, say, uh, artists, which happens actually in, uh, in, the, um, in the Islamic world in different times for different materials. So for instance, we have a very good sense of a history of the art of calligraphy. It begins from the early period. We know who were the greatest calligraphers in different parts of the Islamic world, how important they were actually. Uh, we have a sense of the uh, sort of lineage of ceramicists or, or uh, people who do the metal work or even uh, some of the great um, uh, mosaicists and so forth. So on that level, until the uh, perhaps uh, 17th, 18th centuries, the sense of the full person, the individual, doesn't come through. This is not because it used to be understood within the context of a European arts, as for instance, in European arts, the assumption was that Renaissance is when we get to know individuality of the artist. In the medieval period, they were all the same in some workshop, anonymously working. That wasn't true for European arts. 
nor is it true for Islamic arts, which have always been seen in terms of the individual doesn't matter. No, that's not the case. The case is a different cultural attitude towards the individuality of the artist. Even when an artist signs, they often sign uh, basically hum in a humble way, uh, that there is always this notion that your talent, your expertise, your creativity, which is so sought after, is, a, is basically a God-given gift and that you are always careful about how much you claim individual powers in there. That's embedded in there. We just have to change the way we look at them to really appreciate the particular cultural posture that is taken in medieval Islamic world, for instance. But this is not to say we don't have artist names, but it is generally the case that we don't have biographies until later periods. Thank you. And related to that question, actually, there's another one um, asking how long it would have taken to make the bag um, and whether those artists or craftspeople would have been given high status in the society. Uh, again, another good question for which I have absolutely no answers, really. How long it would take to make the bag? I don't really know. It's, it's, and I don't know we know, properly speaking. Usually these are collective works. So the person who does say the very delicate uh, inlay on, at the end maybe is someone with certain kinds of skills, uh, which is different from the person who uh, hammers the, the sheet metal into shape. Uh, so it's, a, it's usually the work of a collective uh, whether, I mean, high status or status in society at large, uh, there is not enough for us to know exactly who among them, but we must be sure to acknowledge the fact that if uh, a, um, an engraver, a metal worker in Mosul in the 13th and 14th centuries signs, that means that there were customers who wanted his signed work. Great, thank you. There was a question about how the court old actually um, got the collection of uh, metal work. I don't know if you can. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. We do have some information on that. These all came from a 19th century collector, Gambier Perry, Perry, whose collection came to the court old in the 1960s en masse. And it is really one of the great lucks of the Courtauld Gallery to have a collection of that sort, very high quality uh, and, um, and disparate, actually. If you, if you could go and see the exhibition, you would see that there are some wonderful pieces that really show how metal work from the Islamic world was received in Europe. So for instance, Venetian, um, take on this kind of inlay meta work is as important to us to understand in our collection as the ones that were made, say, in Turkey or in Iran or in Egypt in different periods. But that's basically the brief of it. I'm sure you can find more about this if you're interested in on the Courtauld website as well. Yeah, I have to say uh, it's a complete privilege to work with the collection and uh, working on the tour. It's been incredible to see the objects up close. Mm. Um, I will ask a couple more questions and then I think we'll wrap up. Someone asked, um, other than Soraya Syed, do you know of any other contemporary artists that encapsulate the sensory experiences in their artwork that work within an Islamic context? Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. And, and there are quite a number of them who, I mean, this, this is a very uh, special object because of the, uh, the holographic uh, uh, sort of installation that kind of, it's animated, you know, it animates the whole object. Um, an object that is an old object, in fact, she animates it, brings it to life in a way that is very powerful. I have to say, I. I discovered this as I was preparing for this talk, and I thought it was just the perfect example to attach here. But there are others who do, in fact, do think in terms of the way in which, for instance, you will have to walk around a, a, a dome-like structure which has been flat, flatted on the ground, 
and evokes in small chunks of writing brickwork of a of a vaulted dome, for instance. So it requires you to switch the mind's eye between the knowledge of this of the spherical shape of a dome as you look up into it and this flattening, which asks you to look in and deep through the language of mystical poetry into the dome on the ground. This is one of the uh, works that uh, YZ Kami does. Uh, He's an Iranian-American artist. There are a number of them. Uh, the British Museum, when you get to the British Museum in person, in its Islamic galleries, the Al-Bukhari galleries of Islamic art, at the very end of it, there are um, examples of contemporary art in there, which are really worth going to look at and take this perspective onto it too, the way in which artists are thinking about motion, about sound, about the sound of poems. Uh, there's one artist whose calligraphy sounds and feels like a, a breath, as if she's puffed all these letters onto the piece of paper. So there is a lot of this going on. Uh, and I think what is interesting is we tend to think of these as contemporary art uh, strategies. What I'm suggesting is, and I'm learning from contemporary artists' practices, but I'm suggesting that we got to look at the historical objects through different lenses because our contemporary artists are telling us to do it too. Just to add to what um, Suzanne's just said, uh, Sonia's just sent a message to say that the other contemporary artists, for example, there's Zara Hussein and Halima Kassel, and Soraya Sayed has also sent her Vimeo link for the oh, um, graphic pen and sword. So I encourage everyone to have a look because it really is beautiful. It is beautiful. I love that link. Yeah. I think we'll have time for maybe one more question, um, which is, is it possible to read a cross-cultural relation between these objects and those made in early modern era in Europe and America? Oh, yeah, I like, I like that one too. Uh, definitely. And that is the way we should look at them. In other words, uh, first of all, if there is any, any part of the, of the globe in historical terms that would be understood as the hotbed of cross-culturality, it is the Islamic world or Islamicate world in the sense that uh, what united everyone was that the teachings of the Quran uh, and some of the practices. But they all came from, from China to the, the Atlantic, from different ethnicities, languages, and cultural backgrounds. And that they shared in, in the teaching of Islam is, is extraordinary. And of course, an object like the bag is the perfect example of a transculturated object, if I may put it that way, in every respect. It has the, the uh, qualities of what would be an object in between cultures. So Europe and America did not invent this idea. Let me say that. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was really, really wonderful. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for. Thank so, you. Yes, another big and thank you. I, thank, I want to thank the audience as well for all those great questions. It's, it's wonderful. And I, it's my first webinar and I'm delighted for it. I teach online, but a webinar is a different matter. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Thank you also to Sonia from Bradford Museums and yeah, from everyone from joining. Um, the talk will be available from tomorrow online. So um, have a look out on the Courtauld social media channels for that. And there will be more information coming up in the coming weeks about the rescheduled um, dates for the rest of the tour. Um, it should be going to the History of Science Museum in Oxford next. So keep an eye out for that. And um, thank you all so much. Bye. Bye.